The landscape of the south of Scotland, northern England and the Isle of Man is amongst the most beautiful in the British Isles. Millions of tourists come here each year to enjoy the scenery. But what few of us ask is why it's so wonderful. In this series, we'll be delving underneath the landscape to find out what forces have created it. This week, we step back in time to the violent period when the mountains were born and the valleys between gouged out by ice. Ours is an area of contrasts. The Solway is flat and open and lush, and so is the northern plain of the Isle of Man nearby. They stand out against the rugged landscape of the Lake District. It's littered with high mountain peaks which shelter lakes and tarns and the valleys between. Gigantic forces shaped this view, and what we see today took millions of years to create. It was a period of violence and fire, with volcanoes and great earthquakes beating up the surface of the earth around. But it's only recently that we've begun to find out exactly what happened. Part of the answer lies in the Scottish borders. The man who made the first breakthrough was James Hutton, known as the father of modern geology. Way back in the late 1700s, he wrote an extremely controversial book called The Theory of the Earth. It had the nerve to challenge the book of Genesis, arguing the world was much older than the Bible said. Hutton based his evidence on landscape features he called unconformities, places where two different types of rocks could be seen lying on top of each other. He argued this could only have happened if there had been a very long period of time between each of the layers being deposited. Sicker Point in Berwickshire is one of Hutton's unconformities and a place which attracts geologists from all around the world. Two great impacts that geologists had on the way in which people think was firstly that the demonstration by people like Hutton of the immense antiquity of the earth uh, appeared to conflict with the biblical tale of Genesis and Noah's flood. The discovery of human fossils occur only very late in the history of the earth. Uh, and secondly, that man has come very late on the scene and he wasn't an initial creation. Both of them conflict with the church, but geology simply has, as many other sciences have, disrupted earlier patterns of knowledge. Less than a mile south of Jedburgh is another of Hutton's unconformities, on the banks of the Jed water. What Hutton saw here is normally hidden deep below the surface, but this river has cut a channel through the rock to reveal its secrets. What we have here is a layer of sandstone which runs vertically from what is now the water line, and if we follow it up, we find there's a different layer of horizontal rocks laid on top. Now the process of creating that second layer takes a very long time and we now know the difference in the age of these two layers is about 55 million years. It's amazing that the borders has played such an important part in explaining how our landscape was made. And Hutton wasn't the only geological genius from these parts. A hundred years later, a schoolteacher from Melrose called Charles Lapworth followed in his footsteps. On a hillside high above the Moffat Water Valley is an ordinary whitewashed cottage. But as a plaque on the wall explains, it was here that Lapworth stayed as he explored Dobbs Lynn, another of Britain's most important geological features. Lapworth took a keen interest in the rock formations of the south of Scotland, an area about which little was known. But thanks to his study and knowledge of ancient sea creatures called graptolites, which are fossilized in the rock, Lapworth was able to prove that layers across a vast area had been laid down at the same period in time. Geologist Jim Floyd has been following in his footsteps. And the, the advantage of graptolites is that they were in the oceanic realm, so you can find them all around the world. And also, they evolved through time quite rapidly, so that finding a particular type of graptolite at one locality and finding the same graptolite at another locality almost anywhere in the world, you have a good chance of saying that the rocks are exactly the same age. 
Lapworth's research was a huge step forward in our knowledge of Silurian rocks, those laid down more than 400 million years ago. Thanks to him, Dobbs Lynn has become the benchmark by which other landforms of this age, wherever they are in the world, have come to be measured. Scotland is very lucky in having the base of the Silurian system defined at this point. It's what we call a golden spike. It is defined at this point worldwide. So if anyone looking at rocks of the same age in America, China, Australia, anywhere like that, and they want to compare their base of their Silurian, they have to come here and compare it. One final key remained to be found, and it would show that the surface of the Earth moves more than had been previously thought. A German scientist, Alfred Wegener, came up with a theory of continental drift. He suggested that the position of the Earth's continents had changed over time. It would revolutionize our view of the planet and lead to a growing understanding that the Earth's surface is made up of a series of plates which float on the mantle beneath. This discovery was initially made by Wegener in the 1930s, that if you compare the coastlines of Africa and South America, amazingly they seem to fit together. And of course we discovered that in eastern North America there were fossils in fairly young rocks that had precise equivalents on the on the western side of Europe, implying almost that they must have been contiguous. And from then on, it's produced an enormous discovery of the ways in which the movements of continents have moved through time, how they've influenced the uplift of mountains and the formation of ocean, ocean basins, and how floras and faunas have spread over the Earth. It's been a tremendous revolution. To see an example of plate tectonics in action, you only have to travel as far as the Isle of Man. Niarbal is a tiny old fishing community set in idyllic surroundings on the west coast. The rocks which surround the bay are dramatic and were notoriously dangerous during storms for the fragile fishing vessels that once put to sea from here. But what we're looking for is this thin white line which marks the coming together of two vast continents from thousands of miles apart. If we go back about what? 550 million years ago, the Isle of Man, or where the Isle of Man is now, was located in the Southern Hemisphere and progressively over geological time, um, this area has moved to the north. In doing so, um, what was then the Isle of Man, which was at the margin of a, a large continent, has uh, collided with other continents. And at one time, the Isle of Man was basically tropical seas, very deep water on the margin of a continent. The conditions around the Isle of Man are very different today. But the contrasts which exist in such a relatively small area show how violent the actions of the plates were. Today, the San Andreas Fault, running north through California, is one of the world's most geologically active places. Movements between the plates which come together on the west coast produce hundreds of earthquakes a year. And the forces which caused devastation in places like San Francisco were once in action on the Isle of Man. When the collision occurred, you had the sort of interaction between two rock groups from the southern side of the ocean, the northern side of the ocean, and that's now reflected the slightly different ages in the two big rock groups that occur in the island. In the, island. the Manx Slates, which are much deeper water sediments, were on the southern side of the ocean, whereas the, the uh, rocks that you see at Niarbil were on the northern side of the ocean, and they're thrust over one another as the two continents collided. So at Niarbil is a very well exposed thrust plane which separates these two rocks. Niarbil is a prime spot for observing the meeting of these continents, but it's only one point on a line which stretches for thousands of miles. And although it's rarely as obvious as it is on the Isle of Man's west coast, if you know what you're looking for, the clues and the types of rock are there to see. And they show that the political boundaries of Britain are also geological boundaries. And what's really fascinating is that the boundaries of each rock type also became the political boundaries of Britain. Once upon a time, Scotland and England were quite separate. There was an ocean between them. And that ocean gradually got narrower and narrower uh, and eventually it disappeared altogether and two plates became fused together and uh, the line of fusion is actually more or less the line of the Solway River. You can see quite strong differences in the geology to the north and the south. 
For a start, it marks the end of the Pennine, the Pennine Hills. The Pennine structures don't continue when you go further north over, over the Solway line. So the, the, the border between Scotland and England is more than a political boundary.